Welcome back to this third part of three videos about the Pleiades. My name is Hugh Evans, I'm author of Origin of the Zodiac and if you haven't already done so I invite you to please see the other two videos ahead of this one so that you will uh, gain a better understanding and have more enjoyment I hope. So this uh, first video of the three was about the origin of the origin and it relates to where the Pleiades is in the night sky and how important it is with regard to the constellations all about. The Pleiades have been in the night sky for millions of years but the most modern constellations have only been around for a few tens of thousands of years because of the movement of the stars and our ancient ancestor astronomers knew this. They could see that the Pleiades moved and in part two of this three-part video series, we looked at the proper motion of the Pleiades, how the Pleiades moves with, in relation to the fixed stars behind it. And this is important because our ancient ancestor astronomers saw this movement and they named the Pleiades and created the myths to reflect this. So here is uh, some diagrams from the two previous videos. Our sun is in a helical relationship with Sirius going around the red giant Arcturus and these uh, stars are also named to reflect their relationships with our solar system and our Sun and the whole group is going around the Pleiades and the Pleiades is going around our galaxy and that's the center over there and there is the Pleiades at the center of this rotation that we are having with Arcturus and even within the center of the Pleiades the stars are going around Alcyone and our ancient astronomer ancestors knew this because over millions of years if they weren't going around together it would just disperse and be lost in time but it's not it it's endures and we're really only just getting to grips with this um, with our supercomputers, our giant telescopes and our satellites. So it just boggles the mind how our ancient astronomer ancestors actually understood this. But they, as I've said, they named the stars to reflect it. And here is the, the star maps of Gwyneth. There's the center of the pole star, uh, the plough on Kada Idris and the orange line is ecliptic. And to create the star maps, you need one other fixed point and I'm suggesting this is the Pleiades here and from that you can chart the heavens which is what Enoch did from his chair above Kada Idris and this is where the constellations were created. So why the Pleiades? Let's have a quick look at the star group. These are the seven sisters um, probably nine stars brightly here. These two on this side are the parents of the seven sisters. They are Atlas and Pleione. Let's look at those first. Atlas was the first king of Atlantis and sometimes the Pleiades are called the Atlantides. This shows the antiquity and importance of the star group. Atlas was the grandson of Uranus and Gaia, as was his consort Pleione. Uranus is in Welsh is the and U or Ani is to contain. That is a Roman suffix. And that means the god who contained the universe, which is actually what Uranus did. But let's come back to Pleione. She was an Oceanid nymph and the suffix own is Greek and it means a female person. So let's look at the, the first component of this word and in the Welsh language which is our living remnant of ancient British and gives us an insight back before the Noah flood and perhaps to the civilization of Atlantis before the previous cataclysm. This means belonging to a group or party 
and planiad is light, radiance, and plaith is a braid or a wreath, and together this explains the Pleiades much better than the Greek explanation, which really isn't an explanation at all. A group of bright stars in a ring. The Greeks also referred to the star group as the flock of doves. That will be important later. Let's go over to Mesopotamia and I would just like to um, thank Gavin White and uh, refer to his book Babylonian Star Law. It's, it's been quite a lot of my uh, research and the Assyrians, which is one of the most recent empires, talked of the seven sons of Enmeshara, and they were called the Sabiti. In the Babylonian Empire before that, the star cluster was called the leader of the celestial heavens, and in the Mul Apin star catalogue had the most important name Mul Mul, and actually I believe this um, cuneiform syllable um, was derived from the Pleiades and then applied to all the other constellations. The Akkadians before the Babylonians called the star cluster the Bristle, Zapu and Sebeti, the seven demons. So that's been carried through to the Assyrians and the Sumerians also referred to Enmeshara and the seven warriors, the Sebetu. So that's in summary. Let's look at the Assyrians. Seven in Welsh is Saith. It is emblematic of an arrow or direction. Se from the Sebeti is what is fixed and relates to a star. And the next syllable but bit but has a number of meanings and I've just created an excerpt here from the Welsh dictionary to show you that naturally is the case and these words mean a world universe tie keeping together a band and to endure so we have got a complete description here of the the star cluster something that's going in a um, a group or a band that is going in a direction that's enduring, that's held together, we are tied to it. It's the world and the universe. In the Babylonian tradition, we can look at leader, which is glud and gluid, means fair, pure, and holy. Um, tuis is also uh, a word for leader, and that is a leader, a procession. Tuin is a star. So um, the Pleiades is leading the procession, if you like, up, uh, and is a group of stars. Um, in the Mulapin, we have Mul Mul. Well, in the Welsh language, the U is pronounced the same as I. So this would have to be Mil, Mul or Mul. And these words are the root for these English meaning, so mill is a thousand, but it's also used figurative to uh, to mean a multitude, and a millwir is a warrior. That will be important later, or even at the bottom of the page here, Sumerian the seven warriors. And a mool uh, uh, is a concrete concretion, an aggregate, or a lump. And a mould is a what is in grains, grainy, and that's where we get mould from. So this um, also describes the Pleiades, a multitude in a lump, a grainy multitude. The Akkadians talked of a bristle, which is a gurhik, uh, the bristle or the thicket, and a gwirin is a harness and a gwirid is a chain. So they were recognising that the Pleiades, or we are linked to the Pleiades, and we are harnessed to it in a rotating relationship. And za ap pu in Welsh would be sa ap u. Uh, sa se s is what is fixed and is applied to a star. Ap means sun, 
we've had that seven sons up here and u as a suffix in the Welsh language just creates a name that explains zapapu uh, demons also relate to pureness which we had before and particles and in the Sumerians which is the oldest empire in Mesopotamia we they talked of fierce warriors and they fought a fight with Enmeshara against the gods in the underworld and I think this was a time when um, there may have been changes to the pole direction on the planet earth and the Pleiades were seen to alternate between the southern celestial hemisphere beneath the ecliptic and and their current position in the northern hemisphere above the ecliptic but it could even go back to an older time because the Pleiades actually travels around the Milky Way appears to do so from our perspective and that will take it into the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere but we are talking an incredible length of time millions of years so fierce um, has these meanings in Welsh and they imply thick, firm, steady, grainy, multitude and what pervades and what is constant. All wonderful descriptive terms for the Pleiades and the warriors are the Milwyr or the Cadwyr. So again we have Mil, Thousand, we have the band, we have the group and Cadwyr, Cadu is a flock and a group. We had flock from the Greeks and we will see flock again. Going over to Egypt, this is the hieroglyph for the Pleiades. They also talked about the seven Hathors, the goddess of the living and the dead and of lovers. They also called it the myriad or the flock. If we applied this glyph to the Babylonian tradition, and we have to read the way it's facing so we're reading actually now right to left star mill 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 would be sir mill 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 in the welsh language and that means star thousands or multitude grainy aggregate so that's what that hieroglyph means applying the welsh language we can look at it in a bit more detail and I use Ross Broadstock's Cymroglyphics book to help understand the meaning of hieroglyphs. He's put together this wonderful book summarising a lot of work done by Wilson and Blackett over a number of their books. And what we actually have here is a cleft egg, an arrow and a Titian cake. So a cleft egg has these words for cleft and they have the English meanings motion, universe and course. We have an arrow which is a direction and the Titian cake means you are but can also apply to uh, abstract meanings like tid or tidmwi which is a chain or a tether and together we have um, motion on a course um, chained and tethered to something presumably in the middle and that is going on a direction and this symbol here is actually one of the few compound hieroglyphs that has its own meaning in Egyptian it means a thousand on the numbers and um, it must be extremely old The seven Hathors, goddess of the living and dead. Well, the living and dead represent the mortal and underworlds and the position of the Pleiades near the ecliptic. Um, and above the ecliptic is the mortal world and under the ecliptic is the underworld. And as we've just um, discussed with the Babylonian pantheon, it may result from um, observations of pole shifts or observations over a very long period of time and love is a carry and it um, can mean or imply kadu to care 
and um, that is also the word for a flock and Kadwir is a fighter or a warrior which we had in the Babylonian pantheon or the Mesopotamian uh, pantheon again. Uh, they also called it the myriad so um, and the flock so we have mur or mirth for pure and infinity from myriad and I think this is also the root for the word myrrh as in gold frankincense and myrrh uh, flock kadu and kaduen is to care and uh, means a flock but kadwin is a chain and gre greal is an aggregate or a code um, a flock is also a cloud cloudin which means a throng host flock and a drift so again we have some concepts here of great space infinity drifting aggregates chained to something a thronger host grial would is interesting here for code i've just put that in because some people might um, be interested in that from the perspective of the Holy Grail and this excerpt from the dictionary shows that myriad means mirth is mirth that's the English that's the Welsh but also it means 10,000 the Bible uh, the Pleiades is mentioned in the Bible several times and in modern versions it's actually referred to as the Pleiades but in these um, Old Testament books, the very earliest Bibles referred to them in the Hebrew name. It is also mentioned in Revelations, but not by name. Applying our Welsh language to Kima or Kimal, we have Kum is the root for many words that mean companion or association. Kumhleth is twisted together, Chled is an axis and Chlech is a stone emblematic of a star and Kumal Kumalog is a joint articulation or knotty so we have here a notion of stars an axis being articulated together with something perhaps at the center of an axis and an association. In the ancient British tradition we have two names for the Pleiades. We probably all know the Seven Sisters but let's look at the other name which is Tur Tudis. It's also written Tutwiris. So Tur Turin is a pile, a tumult, it's also the word for a constellation, and Turin is a turn. Tu is thick, maybe a group of things, or a large group of stars together, and Tuis, Tuiseni, is a top, a tuft, but also interestingly, Tuiseni is to spire, which is the motion of our solar system around the Pleiades turning in a spire the seven sisters in the ancient Br British uh, tradition where we have already seen that we have seven war gods from the um, Mesopotamian pantheon seven sisters from Greek and Roman um, mythology the mythology from around the Black Sea talks of seven water nymphs and um, we also have the seven spirits from the Baltic tradition, seven starry brothers and the Norse tradition we have Freya's chicks of which the Danes tell us there were seven. From North America the Cherokee, Iroquois and the Pawnee talk of seven brothers 
and the Navajo, Lakota and Sioux of Seven Sisters. There they are, seven brides for seven sisters. In India and Nepal, the mythology is about seven sisters. And in Japan, they have several myths talking about six or seven sisters or six or seven warriors. And the last time there was a conjunction of one of the major stars within the Pleiades so that the number reduced from seven to six was about 60,000 years ago. In Thailand, they talk of seven chicks. And the original Australians talk of seven sisters and their myth is at least 50,000 years old because that is how long they had been isolated from the rest of um, cultures, mythologies up until quite recently. And it might even be 100,000 years old in this article. So let's look at that. Why seven sisters? Well, seven we've already seen is an arrow and um, figuratively a direction. And a sister is a where and um, it implies the root word hui or hui, hui, which makes many words in the Welsh dictionary that have meanings to turn, like for example, chwilfa is an orbit or a course, and chwilio is to turn or revolve. So we have this sense of orbiting and turning, revolving around a direction, which is exactly what our solar system does around the Pleiades and a chick is just um, points to the same root word. We do have brothers and they would be broad or fraud and that would be a group a tumult, a tumult which we've had before full of motion flux or stream and warriors we've had before already milweir and kadweir it's a multitude or a flock uh, so our Welsh language as a living remnant of ancient British explains all of the ancient mythology about the Seven Sisters. And this is just to recap, you can see we're going around Arcturus and the group is going around the Pleiades. And within the group itself, the stars are rotating around Alcyone. So let's look at Alcyone because why would you call the star in the middle the kingfisher, which is what Alcyone is the Greek word for? So I think the Greeks heard that it was the kingfisher and they just translated it into their word. So in Welsh, a kingfisher is a glas erdorlan or a pigin erdurf. And let's look at these. In literal meaning, a glass e er durlan is a green blue, that's glass, the riverbank. And a pilgen er durf is a magpie, the water. So looking at the uh, glass er durlan, green blue are the colours of life and death, which is the mortal world and the underworld. And that implies the ecliptic and the riverbank is the Milky Way along which the side of which the Pleiades is moving and the Pleiades is located at where the Milky Way crosses the ecliptic. So we have a good explanation why Alcyon would be called the Kingfisher but Dorlan also mutates to Torlan and that implies Tor Torf, Toch, Torm, and Chlan, which is a multitude, a boss, that is something about which things turn, a wreath, a circular wreath which is stretched around. So a good explanation for Alcyone. And just as a passing interest in the Welsh language, Tortha is a thousand million. Very handy when you're counting sheep. Pirgen er durf, magpie the water, 
pig pib pid is a point, a tapering point, and durf tur turen is water, again emblematic of a stream, maybe the Milky Way, and a pile, a constellation, and a turn with a tapering point. So we have some wonderful explanations why Alcyone is called or named as such. And here are the Magnificent Seven. Um, those people who know the origin of the film will know it is a remake of Akira Kurosawa's Magnificent Seven Samurai, which is the Japanese myth about the Pleiades. And in this poster, you can only really see six samurai. And this alludes to the myth that there was a seventh that um, has disappeared. And that is the same as the Subaru badge on the car. There are six stars because the seventh um, came down to earth and actually um, fell in love with a fisherman. So that's the myth surrounding the Japanese mythology. And we also have Snow White and her seven miners. So um, at the end of this video, I will give you a little glimpse as to what Hollywood means. So we have some good um, Hollywood movies here. Let's have a quick look at Snow White. And this was originally a Brothers Grimm tale, but they took it from ancient mythology um, that had descended down to the medieval time. So a miner is a moonwir, moon and gem or gem are minerals, jewels, a boss or a point. Moon and munol mean in, eternal and munig is swivel. So again we have this notion of turning around a point. And then the miners themselves in Welsh, they are called Gor, Kor, Korach, Korig, Korin, and imply Kor, a circle. And a choir is a group of things, a group of people, normally in a circle, um, in some sort of relationship. Another name for the miners are the Grachen, uh, implying Grech, sparkling, or the Chlegrin. And the root word chleg means what turns around, and we also have chled about an axis, and chlech, which is stones emblematic of stars. So coming soon, um, we are going to do a video on Taurus, the um, the constellation and zodiac sign Taurus, and I'll be referring to this image from the Lasso Caves approximately 15,000 before current era and there you can see the Pleiades and Taurus and here Taurus is drawn in part. Taurus is always drawn in part and the origin of that was on the star maps of Gwyneth so that gives you some idea as the age of the star maps of Gwyneth and it is described in my book The Origin of the Zodiac. Also coming up soon I will be doing a short video on the original name of Stonehenge. I hope you'll find that interesting. And at the very end of this video, I will tell you the meaning of Hollywood. If you're interested in my book, then the paperback is available at originofthezodiac.com and kumraglyphics.com. And there is an e-version available on Kindle. Um, if you want to get the videos on Taurus and Stonehenge coming up, then please ring the bell and you'll get a notification. And you might like to share with other people who their star sign might be Taurus or they might be interested in Stonehenge. So I would be grateful if you do that. And now we can have a look at Hollywood and see what it means. And I came across this as I looked for cleft. Here is the uh, excerpt from my Welsh dictionary, and it means omnipresent. And obviously we have stars in Hollywood as well. So there are the omnipresent letters of the Hollywood name on Hollywood Hills 
for everyone to look at. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you next time.